and stand up for them. When I think that there is something that's not just for students, I feel I have an ethical imperative and an ethical obligation to get involved. And a lot of my work that I've done advocating for college athletes, both from an antitrust and labor law point of view, comes as someone who's in the classroom, who sees that we have an NCAA that makes 11, million, uh, sorry, 11 billion dollars per year, that there are member schools that make over 140 million dollars per year. And I think the time has come where someone, and hopefully a lot of us, begin to stand up for the college athletes and make sure they get their due for all the labor work and all the efforts they put in. All right. Um, I, I now I'd like uh, you guys to address um, a, just a, give a brief overview of the college athletics business model. Um, so if you could give a rough breakdown of how revenue is generated. Um, I guess we'll start with you, Alicia. Okay, so th there's a handful of items or ways that an athletics department generates revenue. In 1984, the United States Supreme Court decided a case called the University or Board of Regents of the University of Oklahoma versus NCAA. And essentially what that case allowed, the decision of that case allowed for, is either individual colleges and universities or conferences to own and sell the broadcasting rights for their athletic events. That was a game changer in college sports. It was a game changer in the sense that if you go to the majority opinion, the majority of the Supreme Court said that college sports is a business. The dissent was written by a man who actually played college football, one of nine justices that actually had a background in college sports, and he said, no, 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 college sports is not a business. But in that 1984 decision, so we're coming in on 30 years of that, we've seen the landscape of revenues for college sports change drastically. We're now the six major conferences, if you want to call the old Big East a major conference still, that's up for debate. Um, save for the Big East, the other five all have multi-billion dollar television contracts. So that's the biggest thing driving revenue of your major college sports. Other than that, you have apparel and merchandising Ticket sales, of course, concessions. Uh, one university, Louisville, their basketball team is actually a basketball team that generates more revenue than the football team, and that's because they get to sell beer at their basketball games, and <laughs> our friends in Kentucky <laughs> enjoy that. So th those are the main things driving revenue of college sports, and as Quinn pointed out, some of these athletics departments generate revenues each year over $100 million. In 1917, uh, Judge Kennesaw Mountain Landis uh, for a district court in Pennsylvania said that something else was not a business. Baseball. We all know how funny that is today if we were to think of Major League Baseball as not being a business. And the NCAA in so many ways today functions much like Major League Baseball. The main difference is instead of 30 teams that are coming together, you've got 1,000 and 66 colleges that all come together to make concerted agreements with one another. At $11 billion per year in average revenue, the NCAA is the third largest sports league in the United States, behind the NFL and Major League Baseball, ahead of the NBA and the NHL. One school, the University of Alabama, I mentioned it before, $143 million in annual revenue. That is more than 25 out of 30 NBA teams. That is more than all 30 NHL teams. March Madness that we're watching. It's a $10.8 billion contract that comes down to $770 million per year for a tournament that lasts roughly three weeks. On the revenue side, Alicia hit um, the main revenues. They're no different for the most part than other sports leagues. Television, licensing, seat sales, 
Alicia mentioned alcohol sales. I think there's a lot of irony in that there. The very same schools that say we want a dry campus. You know, their students aren't allowed to drink beer. We use them to peddle it. And then best of all for the NCAA, when we know what the revenue side is, what's the cost side? If you look at the other four sports leagues, the players make between 45 to 50 percent of revenues. And those are revenues, not profits. The college athletes, zero percent of revenues. You could say they get a full free education. Perhaps later today we could talk about the real cost of providing that education. Perhaps we could also talk about how they are removed from the classroom up to a quarter of days in certain semesters just to travel and play in games. But when you have no labor cost, it's going to be a lot of profit that will be allocated in other ways. Can you, you started to, to go the, this direction, but can you talk about the, the costs um, at the individual at athletic department level? Like where the money that individual athletic departments are making, where are they spending that money? It, it depends who you believe. So Title IX is a piece of federal legislation that was passed in 1972. The regulations that were enacted for that law in 1975 applied Title IX to sports. And in time, what the Department of Education, who oversees Title IX, has required is athletic institutions who receive federal funding have to report annually to the Department of Education about their revenues, expenditures, how much they're divvying out for college scholarships to these athletes, et cetera. If you look at the data that these institutions submit annually to the Department of Education under Title IX, most of them are breaking even. Their revenues equal their expenses. And there's a lot of economists, a lot of scholars who call that very clever accounting because what essentially, allegedly, is happening is they're taking the revenues and reinvesting them somewhere else within the athletics department. A lot of times that reinvestment is to pay down debt service payments on new stadium bills. There are, so you, you see these high revenues, you see the high expenses, but at the end of the day, they have to be making money. Um, and one, I believe it was, no, it's an economist that I follow. In the last 17 years, 17 schools have joined the FBS, which is the Football Bowl subdivision of the NCAA. And this man's argument is, if this wasn't a winning economic model, people would not be flocking to it. So are they cooking their books? Aren't they cooking their books? That's up for debate, but your top Athletics departments are generally generating a positive net income over $1 million. Universities like Notre Dame, their athletics department actually funds about 80% of non-student athlete scholarships. So these are really profitable ventures. Uh, where is the money going? Uh, the average FBS Division I football coach makes $2.05 million a year before endorsements. The average NCAA Division I men's basketball coach before endorsements, over a million dollars. Athletic directors, assistant coaches, heading very much in the same direction. In 40 out of 50 states, the highest paid state employee, a member of that public school athletic program. Here in Kansas, do you guys know who the highest paid state employee is? Bill your taxes, Bill Self, your head basketball coach is the highest paid person. So there's a lot of money that stays in the system. And the people that run the system have the incentive to keep it that way. Because if a share of it would be allocated to college athletes, you would be seeing this windfall profit amount that the coaches and athletic directors get go down immensely. Where else is the money going? The NCAA now has an enforcement manual that makes the IRS code look simple and clear. <laughs> Every school has several people that work in athletic compliance. As a law professor, perhaps this is a good thing. It creates an opportunity for law jobs 
where they might otherwise be lacking. <laughs> but the NCAA has a hugely inflated staff to implement complex rules to prevent compensating college athletes. Perhaps we get rid of these rules, we get rid of some of this big book, we get rid of all the employees that enforce these rules, and there might just be something left for the people that give 40 to 50 hours per week devoted to playing this sport that improves the prestige and the reputation of the university. So the money goes to all different types of places, and we're not going to talk about cookbooks, uncookbooks, we're not going to talk about exact numbers as far as I'm concerned. Just one point. Look at how much goes to the coaches and athletic directors. And when Jim Beheim, the head coach of Syracuse University, gets up publicly and has the audacity to say that college athletes that want some compensation are idiotic, is it really idiotic? Or is he just trying to protect the windfall that he and others currently have? Quinn, can I disagree with something Mark Absolutely. said? Absolutely. Um, part of Mark's point was that it is, it's these coaches who are, I'm paraphrasing what you said. Feel free. Begging for more and more money. And so often, as society, we're quick to put the onus on the coaches as being the problem that's driving this train. The highest paid coach at the collegiate level in the United States is Nick Saban, Alabama's football coach. And Nick and a contingency of his fellow SEC coaches, the SEC has the most profitable or highest net income football programs in the United States. <coughs> They've come out and said, we would be more than happy to take pieces of our salary and divvy it up amongst our players. So I don't know if it's necessarily the coaches who are begging for more and more money or if it's the coaches who are taking advantage of a market that doesn't um, exist for student athletes and we have to determine well what is preventing that market from existing for student athletes and that would be the NCAA bylaws that Mark alluded to which also prevent things like Mark Richt who's the head coach at the University of Georgia wanted to take part of his salary to help bump up his assistant coaches salaries and he got slapped on the hand by the NCAA for that so I think the real driving force and this issue is not necessarily the coaches or the athletics directors, but the NCAA and its archaic bylaws. Uh, I agree with what Alicia is saying very much. Uh, the only catch is what is the NCAA. And in reality, the NCAA to me is nothing at all. It's a trade association. It is a cartel. Much like OPEC is nothing at all but a collection of members, the same is true for the NCAA. For the NCAA to maintain the policies it maintains, it means that a majority of its membership has to vote to maintain it. The question becomes who's making the decision at the membership level. Uh, I'm not sure about Nick Saban and what he's offered to student athletes. I do know that Steve Spurrier has been one of the proponents for reform and several of the SEC coaches have supported that. The problem is when these proposals were put up to the NCAA, they're continuously being voted down. So if I had alluded to the fact that all coaches were out there for themselves or none wanted to improve the status of college athletes, the impression I would have given would be very much wrong. But when you take the gestalt, when you take all of them, when you take the majority and vote, the votes keep on coming back the same way. Irrespective of what the college students want, irrespective of how they want it, and irrespective of how reasonable the initial request may have been, maybe as little as a $2,000 per year stipend, behind the blind votes, they keep getting voted down. Well, you, you have to look at who's voting. And the NCAA's governance structure is a, a huge point in, of contention in this entire debate. There's an independent organization called the Knight Commission and what they do is they basically oversee the governance of the NCAA. They engage in independent research and investigations into that setup and make suggestions about how the NCAA can reform itself. Does the NCAA necessarily pick up on those suggestions? That's up for debate. But currently, the Division I Board of Directors for the NCAA is really where the policies and the strategies 
for the organization are created. That board of directors is made up of 18 people. Six of those people are presidents of the six major conferences in college sports. That leaves 12 other people who are presidents of universities from conferences from the football championship. So smaller colleges, not your highest performers at college athletics. These schools generate less revenue than your Alabamas, your University of Miami's, your University of Kansas's, and because of that, it's understandable why they might be less inclined to open up the pocketbooks of their coaches and let their coaches dole out extra money to student athletes beyond their scholarship. But isn't that such a sweet solution? Let's think about this here in Kansas. We know that the Kansas City Royals are a small market team. We know that the Kansas City Royals would love if the New York Yankees and the Los Angeles Dodgers didn't spend this much money on players. Hmm. Wouldn't they love to all get together, all 30 Major League Baseball teams, and reach an agreement that we cap player salaries at a very low amount? just enough that maybe that job is better than the next best alternative, but far below the free market rate. We're laughing. It sounds horrendous, absurd. It's what we had in the United States until Marvin Miller came along and unionized the Major League Baseball players. That's what we had in the NFL and the NBA before the antitrust suits were brought by brave people like Spencer Hayward in the NBA, John Mackey in the NFL. What we're seeing happening today in college sports is very similar to what we were seeing in the premier professional leagues in the late 1960s and early 1970s. A movement to break up these cartels in which they set the wage at zero, and, and a movement through the National Labor Relations Act to attempt for the athletes to get the opportunity to unionize so that those schools where unionization takes place will have an obligation to bargain with the student athletes over the three mandatory terms and conditions of bargaining. Hours, wages, working conditions. That for a change in the professional sports leagues, perhaps that's the way to bring change in college as well. Now, we've seen recently uh, um, some legal movements to change the status quo in, uh, in the NCAA. Uh, when I began my research for this topic, uh, two of the first articles that I came across were a back and forth that the two of you had in <laughs> Forbes, actually about the uh, Northwestern uh, football players' attempt to unionize. And then a week ago, the uh, Chicago Regional Office of the National, National Labor, Labor Relations Board found that the players are, in fact, employees and, that, and they ordered a union election. Uh, can you describe the details of the case and the potential complications that Title IX might present? You can start. Okay. So, details of the case. Kane Coulter, up until this off-season of college football, was the quarterback at Northwestern University. As a college professor, I'm very excited by this next piece. He learned something in class, and he took what he learned, and he applied it. Uh, what he learned is that in the United States, under the National Labor Relations Act, employees have the right to unionize to collectively bargain for those three things that Mark discussed earlier wages, hours, and conditions of employment. And he, he got to thinking, and what he did after he got to thinking again as a professor, I love that he's going home to his apartment and thinking about class and lecture, but he said, okay, I'm, I'm gonna research this issue some more, and his research led him to a man named Ramogi Huma. Ramogi is a former UCLA football player who is leading a movement that initially wasn't aimed at unionizing college athletes, but it was aimed at providing better rights for student athletes and possibly leading to them being paid. So the two of, two of them team up, they begin investigating the possibility of unionizing the Northwestern 
um, university football team. They pair up with some lawyers. They end up joining alongside with the Steelworkers Union. Uh, I, I believe 60% of the team voted in support of moving forward with filing a petition to unionize. That petition was filed with the regional office in Chicago. Each side got to file briefs on the issue, making their points in those briefs. Hearings were held over the course of a week in Chicago. And last week, the regional director um, issued his decision. And that decision said that, yes, these football players at Northwestern who are on scholarship, so it's a very limited group of people. It does not include walk-ons. It does not include the basketball team. It does not include the female diving team. Scholarship football players at Northwestern University are employees. And that decision was based upon the hours that they spend engaging in football activities, the way their lives are limited by engaging in those football activities, and the revenues, as we were talking about earlier, that the football program brings to Northwestern University. I don't remember what the second half the was. The second half was Title IX. Um, so I think, in fairness, you had written the first piece on Forbes <laughs> to talk about Title IX. Uh, so maybe I'll let you start. <laughs> Um, then I'll give you why I disagree. And in fairness, <laughs> in fairness to Alicia, there have been two articles, one on a Title IX blog uh, and one on the Smithsonian uh, that seems to jump to her defense and attack my view. Yeah. So you could go Thank ahead you. and speak about it first, and maybe I could sway this audience uh, wow. that Smithsonian's wrong. I, I didn't even know that this was Smithsonian blogged about this type of issue or read my Forbes article, so that's cool. Um, they didn't mention you per se, but they, they mentioned me in disagreement. Ah, <laughs> Okay, so like I said earlier, Title IX is a piece of federal legislation that was enacted in 1972, applied to sports in 1975. What Title IX really stands to do in the sports <coughs> world is provide equal opportunities for male and female competitors when a program receives federal funding. Um, over time, what equal opportunity means has been defined. I'm not going to bore you with all the legal tests because I'm guessing most of you aren't lawyers. But one thing that equal opportunities has been come to be defined as being is the amount of scholarships that are being awarded to male student athletes and the amount of scholarships that are being awarded to female student athletes. And to determine whether or not an equal opportunity is being presented in that regard, the percentage of scholarships given to male student athletes has to come within 1% of the makeup of male student athletes on that campus. So if there are 46% of student athletes that are male, between 45 and 47% of an athletics department scholarship budget needs to be allocated to male student athletes. If 53% of the student athletes are female, then between 52 and 54% of the scholarship budget needs to be allocated to female student athletes. So it's not a 50-50 thing, which I think a lot of people get confused of when they hear equal opportunity. Equal usually means 50-50. So the debate arises, OK, if football players are allowed to unionize and collectively bargain for a wage, how is that equal for the female diving team? How is what they're receiving in their scholarship package, if wages would be allocated through scholarship packages, equal? And, and that's a big part of the debate. I've come off of my original stance a little bit since I wrote that article. But I think, and I was talking to Mr. Lacey about this earlier today, this really is going to become a political issue. And it's going to become a political issue in this regard first with respect to Title IX. As I mentioned earlier, Title IX is overseen by the Department of Education, part of our executive branch of government. And I truly believe that if these student athletes ultimately achieve their goal of unionizing and begin receiving wages, that the Department of Education is going to have to issue a policy interpretation guiding athletics departments and guiding schools about how they comply with Title IX and only pay male student athletes. I, I think there's a real issue there. I agree with almost everything she said. 
uh, my concern is uh, this whole notion, and you guys leave today, you can go search uh, NCAA and pace student athletes and Title IX problem. And you are going to find tons of hits that there's a Title IX problem with paying student athletes based on revenue generated. That's because of a bad game of telephone that's taking place on blogs. One person says it, someone else says it, a third person says it. Nobody stops to ask why, where does this come from, or does it make sense? Uh, the story the NCAA has to contend with, the one that I've been talking about repeatedly, and in some ways I think Alicia agrees with very much, is that you have 1,066 institutions and a small number of them that are very profitable that want to maintain the status quo. They don't like the story that the NCAA member schools don't want to compensate college athletes because they want a little less. It makes them look bad, makes them look greedy. They're not sympathetic. So they need to change the story. They need a different reason why college athletes can't have a little bit more. So what do they pull out? Title IX. Title IX is an incredibly important statute. Title IX provides equal educational opportunity to student athletes. Title IX has changed the playing field to give women a real opportunity in college sports. And what the NCAA is doing by saying Title IX is the reason why revenue generating sports can't pay those athletes that generate revenues, it's not only an affront to the college athletes. It's also an affront to Title IX and the women's rights movement in athletics. How they conflict with one another, I can't say for sure, but I'll tell you this. There was a Ninth Circuit case that came down, University of Southern California versus Stanley. The case involved whether the University of Southern California could pay more to its men's basketball coach than to its women's basketball coach. The women's basketball coach brought suit under several grounds, one being the Equal Pay Act, another being Title IX. The Ninth Circuit, which decided the case in one, of a, in one of its decisions, and mind you, this is a circuit that is generally looked at as being pro-plaintiff, pro-equal rights, this is California, came down and said that one of the factors that may be considered in determining the pay of the requisite coaches is the revenues that are generated. And it may, didn't say it is, but it may be appropriate to pay more money to the men's basketball coach than the women's basketball coach if the men's coach generates substantially greater revenues. The court also said that the Equal Pay Act and Title IX are intertwined on this issue and cannot be parsed from one another. Now, the part of the story that the NCAA isn't telling us, because of course this is just one court, and of course it's very possible that other courts could come down in different ways. But if we look at what NCAA member schools have been doing since Stanley versus USC, very many NCAA member schools have relied on this decision as their rationale for paying their men's coaches substantially more than their women's coaches. In fact, the Chronicle of Higher Education, as well as a New York Times study several years back, found that college sports had the, one of the worst wage disparities between men and women anywhere in the United States. So it seems very disingenuous to me that the same association that has relied on this case, Stanley versus USC, for paying, to allow schools to pay more their men's coaches than their women's coaches. Arguing this whole time that that's permissible under Title IX, to now turn around, and when the issue is about not having a little bit more for the men's coaches, but having a little bit less because sharing it with the college athletes now, they're looking at Title IX, which they didn't seem to think stopped any of their other practices. And now they're using that as a shield, and they're saying Title IX is the reason we can't pay college athletes. So let me ask you, are we sure it's really Title IX? 
Or is it possible that maybe it's just these leaders of these member schools and their coaches that, once again, are making the decisions that are in their own self-interest? I'm a California licensed attorney. I love the state. I love being an attorney there. But it always scares me when we base decisions off of the Ninth Circuit because the Ninth Circuit is the most <coughs> overturned circuit in our country. And the one word that you didn't use to describe the Ninth Circuit that I was waiting for was crazy or insane or out there. But you used some other, other good adjectives to describe my beloved Ninth Circuit. <laughs> but let's just think about this for a minute. And you're playing to a wonderful Midwestern audience we have today. But we, I, we agreed we would play devil's advocate. Let's yeah. just look at this. And I just want to make one more point. For people that may feel that the Ninth Circuit is a little bit off the mark, we usually say that it's too liberal, too in terms of equal rights. That's what people are criticizing it for. This is even the Ninth Circuit. If there's any circuit that I would have expected to take a broad interpretation of Title IX, I would have thought it was the Ninth Circuit. So if the Ninth Circuit came down the way it did in the Stanley case, you know, I could really only wonder what the Seventh Circuit would have done <laughs> to that exact same fact pattern. Well, two, two of the other uh, major cases that are going on right now are the O'Bannon case and the, uh, the Kessler lawsuit. Um, with the O'Bannon case, it seems to be focused on whether or not uh, players have the right to be compensated for use of their image. I think it started out with the use of their image in a video game, but it has since expanded beyond that. And in the uh, Kessler suit, uh, uh, the plaintiffs are claiming that the NCAA illegally caps players' compensation. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about these caps and how this might be a little bit different than the unionization case? turning to me as the antitrust guy. Um, well, yes. let me talk about O'Bannon first, because the case has gone on for years. Uh, the O'Bannon case was consolidated with a different case, the Keller case, uh, which came out of California district courts and is working its way up through the Ninth Circuit. I believe it's currently in the Northern District of California. There have been pieces that have been settled out, um, but let me just give a very simplified synopsis of where we are now. Uh, to avoid barring people with procedural history. Uh, the essence of the case challenges, it says that when the NCAA member schools got together and reached an agreement that prevented student athletes from profiting off the use of their own likeness, whether it be in video games or from the share of the television broadcast revenues that are derived, that this represents a restraint of trade under antitrust law that violates Section 1 of the Sherman Act. In essence, the NCAA rules collectively represent a group boycott of any school that does not abide by those rules, thus precluding the possibility of student athletes having the right to control their own likeness. Uh, after all of the modifications to the case, uh, the current proceedings as moving forward as a class action, seek to enjoin the NCAA member schools from all getting together concertedly and enforcing a rule that says student athletes are entitled to 0% of the revenues from their own likeness. If the plaintiffs are successful, that would overturn those rules entirely. Reasonably, individual NCAA conferences could then choose to put in place their own rules. Because unlike the NCAA, which collectively is a collective near monopoly, each conference only represents a small share. The reality, though, is if that were to happen, you would now see the conferences pit needing to pit themselves against each other to get the best college athletes. Once we finally have competition, the likely effect would be conferences would each choose their own rules and as a way of inducing the top athletes to come to their programs, which drive revenue, big revenue for the colleges and their conferences, we'll see a change and some share of the licensing rights would go on to the student athletes. 
The second case. Can I jump in? Sorry. Sure. Before I, I don't know if I necessarily agree with your interpretation of what could happen after O'Bannon. My understanding of the case is the remedy that the plaintiffs are seeking. So Ed O'Bannon, former basketball player at UCLA, he works as a car salesman outside of Las Vegas now. And one day he walks into a friend's apartment. The friend's kid is playing video games. Ed looks at the TV and says, that guy running across the screen, that looks a lot like me. And it puts a light bulb off in his head and Ed thinks, if that's me on a video game, I'm sweating in the Las Vegas sun every day trying to sell cars. I don't know how successful he is at it, but I've never made a dime off of this EA Sports video game and somebody's making a dime off of it. But my understanding of that case is the remedy that O'Bannon and the class of plaintiffs are seeking is essentially for a trust fund to be created from the revenues of broadcasting rights or video game sales that use student athletes' images, and that it would only be after a student athlete's eligibility has expired that he or she could receive a payout from that trust account. So I'm not certain that it's necessarily going to lead to conferences engaging in an arms race of sorts to modify their rules to adapt to the outcome of the O'Bannon decision. Perhaps that's naivety on my part, but I don't necessarily see that happening immediately. Well, the case has changed many times over. Uh, with respect to the video games, uh, that was primarily the Keller versus Electronic Arts component and the early component of the O'Bannon case. Uh, that aspect uh, has moved towards settlement, where Electronic Arts has agreed to pay a fee. I believe it was $40 million for the use of the student athletes' likenesses without their permission in video games. Uh, that currently uh, is waiting to be finalized and presumably that money will be put into trust if they could find a way to allocate it. Uh, as the O'Bannon case has proceeded, once the Keller component against Electronic Arts has moved out, uh, the O'Bannon attorneys have begun to focus more and more on the broadcast licensing aspects as well. Uh, in fact, you'll find that Fox News uh, and the Big Ten Network recently submitted an amicus brief uh, into the case. It's weird that the Big Ten Network is submitting an amicus brief. Uh, that's like my right hand submitting an amicus brief in a case against my left hand. Um, but for whatever it's worth, they are arguing that there is no rights uh, to one's likeness in the context of television broadcasts. Um, irrespective, uh, the individual claims by O'Bannon and the other plaintiffs seeking monetary damages uh, have been removed from the class action. Uh, the individual plaintiffs are allowed to move forward with their claims. Uh, however, those have to be done on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, this current case is about equitable relief moving forward. And it seems like, from my understanding of antitrust law from my practice, the remedy would be to enjoin the NCAA from maintaining the status quo. Uh, what gets put in place after, who knows? And you could very well be right that once the status quo is enjoined, the NCAA might come around and say, we want to negotiate a settlement, or we want to negotiate new rules moving forward. And perhaps that will create such a trust, but that's not necessarily, at least from my understanding, what will absolutely happen with the ruling. At a minimum, what the ruling will certainly do, which will be enjoin or prevent the status quo. What will replace the status quo could very well be what you suggest. I'm not sure it's an absolute. I think it's fascinating that Mark mentions the word settlement. And before, he made a very important differentiation between the EA sports, so the video game part of the case, and what we're currently dealing with, which, as he says, is more focused upon broadcast rights. Two weeks ago, I had dinner with a woman who's on the trial team representing O'Bannon. The trial is slated to begin on June 9th. And I was trying to get as much information out of her as she would give me. And she, she told me, she said, we were really close to a settlement. And then everything imploded. And so legal nerds like ourselves are probably really excited to see the possibility be reached that this case is 
likely headed for trial. And it's going to open up to the public's <coughs> eyes a lot of pressing issues. It's, it's our Board of Regents case of our era, so it's pretty fascinating that we're living in this time. But you asked a question, you brought up another case, you called it the Kessler case. Um, to make it clear, Jeffrey Kessler is not a plaintiff in the case. Uh, Jeffrey Kessler is the lead attorney. Uh, he, I worked with him at Dewey Ballantyne. He's now at Winston Strum. Uh, Jeffrey Kessler has been lead counsel in cases uh, dating back more than 25 years on behalf of NBA players and NFL players. Uh, some would regard him uh, as the most prominent sports antitrust attorney in the country. Uh, what this new case, which was filed in a New Jersey district court attempts to do, is while O'Bannon waxed and waned as they tried to come up with the legal theories, and I think part of why Alicia and I might disagree a little bit about what's going on in O'Bannon has less to do with a disagreement amongst us and more the theories have just kept on changing and it depends what version of the pleadings you're looking at and what exactly licensing wise is tied in. Well, what Jeffrey Kessler suggests, and I'm extraordinarily bullish on this, uh, I actually recently published a Case Western Reserve Law Review uh, called A Brief Treatise on Amateurism and Antitrust Law where I argued these exact same points before the case was filed, is that the NCAA operates like a cartel that restrains players' wages. And we don't need that middle step in O'Bannon. In O'Bannon, because the licensing case was put together with the antitrust case, there was this notion that we're challenging the um, restraint on student athletes' share of the licensing revenues derived from, first it was clearly video games, and then once the video game issue seemed to have gone away, it seemed to be broadcasts. Jeffrey Kessler says, forget this need for this middle ground fiction. The NCAA restrains wage. It's an agreement amongst all the member schools to get together and curb the amount of money that student athletes are able to negotiate for or get. And this new case seems to say it makes no difference if it's licensing revenue or broadcast revenue or ticket sales revenue or any other form of revenue. At the end of the day, the rightful challenge is all of these schools getting together and saying a predetermined scholarship amount is the only acceptable wage. And again, none of these cases seek to mandate the paying of student athletes. And I am not a proponent of mandatory paying of student athletes. What I'm a proponent of, what I believe Jeffrey Kessler's case attempts to accomplish, and if you move out the weirdness and uncertainty of O'Bannon and the weird pleadings in the beginning of it, what I think it today attempts to accomplish is to get rid of rules where a school like the University of Kansas could vote to prevent all of its competitors from paying their athletes and moving towards a system where either individual schools or perhaps conferences of schools will have to make decisions without seeing or without choosing the actions of their competitors. Uh, I, I, we'll have time for one more question from me and then we'll open it up to the audience. Uh, um, one of the, the major, uh, I guess, kind of tangential issues is the, the one, and, one and done rule in the NCAA. Obviously here at KU, we've seen the effect of the one and done rule with Wiggins leaving us, unfortunately. But, um, and in the still pending decision with Joel Embiid. But um, I'd like, like to know your thoughts on whether it makes sense to have this rule in place and what effect paying athletes might have on, on this rule or if it would make more sense to have either a uh, college baseball model that allows students to go straight to the pros or else make a commitment for at least three years, or a, a college football model that only allows people to go after three years post high school. So uh, if you can give me your thoughts on that. I, I really, when we talk about student athletes and the issue of paying student athletes, 
I think the biggest finger should be pointed at the NBA and the NFL. They're really the cause of this problem. I think these limitations that they place on a young man who has the ability, the talent, and the desire to play professional sports and earn a living doing so are unfair, they're unreasonable, and potentially another antitrust lawsuit that could be brought somewhere down the line. I, I'm an educator, so I find the value of education. I'm a first generation college student, and I wouldn't be sitting here where I am today without the education that I received from a scholarship. So I understand the value of what these young men and women receive through their college scholarship. What I, Alicia Jessup, do not have at five foot three inches tall, though, is an athletic ability to earn millions of, and use that athletic ability to earn millions of dollars. And I think it's wrong in a country that is built upon capitalistic principles to prevent a young man from doing that. And so if we're talking about cartels, if we're talking about those type of things, we need to ask ourselves, is the NCAA in cahoots with the NBA and the NFL? Are there conversations flowing from these parties where the NCAA picks up the phone, calls their friend, Raj, Raj Goodell, and says, you know, we're not going to be as profitable if our star players aren't on the field. Or calls David Stern, Adam Silver, and says, look, if we don't have this wonderful Canadian player, Andrew Wiggins, for one year, we're not going to be generating as much revenue. And I, I think that is a real possibility that those type of conversations are ongoing. And I, I, I am a proponent of the baseball model. What sport at the NCAA level do you not hear pay for play scandals? Do you not hear players screaming about being paid? It's baseball. Because those kids have the right after college to go and play in the big leagues if they have the talent to do it. And if they don't have the talent to play in the big leagues, they recognize, I may never make that big league salary, so I better take this education that I'm receiving for free seriously. You know, I think we actually agree a lot more than we disagree. <laughs> um, we're friends, Mark. One other party, and we're going off to Florida for the next round of these debates on Friday, so I'm glad we're going to be leaving this way. <laughs> Um, one other party I actually think does deserve blame here, and I usually compliment them, uh, is the players' unions. Yeah. Uh, I mentioned the Spencer Hayward case very briefly before as one of the antitrust cases that helped to get rights um, for professional athletes. Uh, Spencer Hayward was, an NBA play was a basketball player playing in the ABA, the American Basketball Association, without having competed college. At that point in time, the NBA used to have a rule that said you needed to be four years removed from high school before you could enter the league. Well, Spencer Hayward decided that he was going to challenge that rule under antitrust law, arguing that the NBA teams came together and colluded to boycott people like Hayward that had less than four years of, high school, of college, college education from entering the league. Uh, that case worked its way up. Uh, through the Ninth Circuit, which I don't think was crazy at all there. Uh, a small component of it went to the Supreme Court and was remanded back to the, co the federal courts in California. Uh, the courts ultimately held that the agreement amongst the NBA teams to require players to be a certain age before entering the league was an illegal group boycott in violation of Section 1 of the Sherman Act. And as a result of that case, the NBA got rid of its age requirement altogether. That's why many of us grew up with players like Kevin Garnett and Kobe Bryant and LeBron James, who entered the league directly from high school. Now, all of this went wrong, beginning with the Maurice Claret case, where the NFL Players Association said, hey, wait, we agreed to this age requirement. Now, this becomes interesting on a couple of fronts. We know why the leagues want the age requirement, it shifts some of the development costs to college sports, and perhaps college sports have asked them for it. Now, for an individual player who's a marginal player just hanging on to the, in the league, do you want a player like LeBron James coming in and perhaps taking your 12th man spot on the roster and ending your career? So we know why some of the players were willing to give into it. And what happened was both the NFL Players Association with the NFL 
and the National Basketball Players Association with the NBA agreed to age requirements. Now, as a matter of antitrust law, and greatly oversimplified for our purposes here, um, while these age requirements would otherwise violate Section 1 of the Sherman Act, there is something in the law known as the non-statutory labor exemption for antitrust law. What that means, if it's a matter that the union agrees to, that should be bargained over, and there's a three-pronged test in the Eighth Circuit, and there's a different test in the Second Circuit, but oversimplified, we're saying if the union agrees to it, it will be challenged, if at all, under labor law instead of antitrust law. So the unions, in a big way, help perpetuate or recreate these problems by taking away the easy opportunity for a player that wants to enter the league to challenge it under antitrust law. And perhaps in the Eighth Circuit and some other cases, a player could still challenge it, but the challenge would be a lot easier if these rules did not have the union's approval. All right, we're going to open it up to audience Q&A. If you have a question, please raise your hand. I would like to say, though, uh, please keep it brief and make it a question, not a statement. <laughs> Thanks. So there's 1,066 schools, and the discussion is about football players and men's basketball players basically at the top 66 schools. So if I'm an athletic director at a Division II school or a Division III school or lower Division I, how am I going to deal with this paying the athletes? Are we going to pay in all sports, or what are we going to do? It really depends upon the model that's ultimately adopted. Like we've kind of alluded to today, there's really two paths being driven, the antitrust model, the unionization model. If the unionization model is the one that's traveled down or the road that's traveled down, we're going to have individual schools having to bargain with their athletes. Those individual schools are going to have to be private schools at the NLRB side of things. State schools would have to deal with their own state unionization rules. How, how do the small schools pay for it? I really don't know. Um, at least with unionization, they'd be able to bargain the wage and hopefully open up their books like the NBA had to do in its most recent collective bargaining negotiations to show that it was losing money and those books helped drive down the revenue that it had to share with players. But that, that's one of the biggest sources of contention in this entire debate is, yes, there are schools that are generating hundreds of millions of dollars of revenue, but that's really a small pocket of schools. If we look at the final four, Connecticut, who won the men's basketball championship in 2011, when you think of UConn sports, you think possibly of its women's basketball team, but also of its men's basketball team. That men's basketball team has not generated a positive net income since the year before it won its national championship. So it's not even limited to just your small schools. And that, that, that's a very pressing issue that these athletic department leaders and NCAA officials are going to have to sort out. Um, I'm very bullish about the antitrust solution, and I think the antitrust solution is nice and simple. Many of them won't, and they won't have to. Nobody ever says you have to pay your student athletes. You only do if you want to compete against other schools. Case in point to support that. From 1948 to 1951, the NCAA had something known as the Sanity Code. It prevented any payments, including scholarships of certain types, to student athletes. In 1951, the NCAA implemented new rules. The new rules that went into place, which were the precursor to the modern rules, for the first time allowed schools to provide money up to the cost of what they deemed to be to appropriate tuition. It didn't mandate it, it allowed it. Nevertheless, eight schools known as the Ivy League chose not to do that. They decided that they were not going to provide full scholarships to their student athletes or any scholarships beyond merit and need. Now, the Ivy League continues to recruit very decent athletes. And look at Harvard. They won a round in the NCAA tournament this year by competing on a different set of characteristics, by competing to provide top-notch education or a top-notch brand name that's going to induce student athletes to go there. So for the smaller named school, it will not make them pay their athletes. It'll force them to make a choice. 
the choices they'll have will be accept the fact that you won't have the top athletes and don't worry about paying. Pay them and compete in an arms race to have the top team. Or find something else to compete on that would make college athletes want to choose that program, absent the maximum amount of wage. And maybe this will lead to better academic programs, better treatment of the athletes, more differentiation, more choice. Oh, hi, thank you very much for uh, providing a lot of great insight on a lot of these issues. Um, however, I just have a brief preface and then a question. I think you have slightly mischaracterized the business model as being similar to Major League Baseball and the other professional sports. Um, quite a few universities across the country and athletic departments are subsidized substantially so that they can break even each year. Here at the University of Kansas, uh, out of 86 or roughly 90 million dollars in revenue last year, roughly 20 came from donations to the or tax deductible donations to the athletic department and three million came from subsidies from the university operating budget and the student body. Do you think it is fair that the burden should fall on alumni and students and universities who are currently in debt to pay for student athletes stipends or future salaries? Did you know that back in 1953, the first year of the NCAA, television budgets, the first year under Commissioner Byers, was $1 million. Now, even in today's dollars, that's a heck of a lot less than it is today. And you know what? College athletics operated, and operated fine. So if you're telling me in today's day and age, an athletic program cannot balance their budget with all the money that comes in from television revenues? You know what I tell you? You are operating the single most inefficient business organization in the history of modern commerce. And you want to know why it's inefficient? Because you haven't had to follow antitrust law. And you've been able to exercise rights as a combined monopolist. And we know as a basic matter of economics, not as a matter of sports, not as a matter of NCAA, not as a matter of colleges special, but as a basic matter of economics, that when we allow cartels to exist, we have colossal inefficiency. So you know what? You know, we take this away, you'll find a way to cut the budget, you'll cut the basketball coach's salary, you'll cut the football coach's salary, You'll cut your own salary, and lo and behold, maybe then you'll have something that makes money without having to burden your alumni and beg for them to pay to maintain the salaries you chose to employ with your people. That's just my opinion, but you're free to disagree. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, do the professional leagues, particularly NBA and NFL, reimburse colleges for the expenses of the training? They provide players that ultimately, I, I, I would guess, I don't know, I would guess that most of the NBA players and NFL players come from colleges and universities. But they don't, the, these professional leagues don't pay colleges for any of that development. No, and at the NFL level, what a growing trend, which is pretty fascinating, is the combine training. So when players prepare for the combine in Indianapolis between their last game at the collegiate level up until that date in February, they're training for the combine. And it's actually the agents who are incurring the cost for that combine training to the tune of twenty to fifty thousand dollars, depending on who the player is. And if that player doesn't get drafted, that agent's money is sunk. And I think Mark alluded to a really interesting point that perhaps the reason why we have these restrictions on what age a player has to be to enter those leagues is because the leagues recognize they're getting this free training at the collegiate level. And I think that's particularly true 
at the NBA level. So in February, February 1st or 14th of this year, Adam Silver took over the reins as commissioner of the NBA. And since he took on that job, he has began pushing for a two-year collegiate um, or two, year, two years post high school before you could enter the NBA. And you have to look at that and say, well, why would Adam Silver want this two-year requirement? Is he really focused on educating these kids? No, it's because Adam Silver realizes that these one-and-done players, if you look at the players who were one-and-done and were drafted in the NBA this year, where are, all, where are those guys? They're in the D-League. They aren't playing in NBA games. They're playing in the development league, and he realizes that, and he wants to push the cost back to the universities. Uh, everybody's kind of talked about the different possibilities and the different effects on uh, college athletics by potentially paying athletes. Just to ask a very direct question, uh, what do you all think is the best path for handling the paying of college athletes after uh, this becomes widespread? Uh, is it? guaranteeing everyone scholarships for four years? Is it figuring out a flat fee? Is it the conferences coming together, as you stated earlier, and doing a sort of arms race for uh, the best talent? That's all my question. You know, as we saw in the antitrust cases um, brought against the professional sports leagues over the years, uh, the resolution of those cases tend to lead to settlements, uh, irrespective of whether there's a union in place or not. I think the reality is that if the players win in the O'Bannon case at the last stage and where that case could go, whether it be an appellate court or a Supreme Court, it'll force the NCAA to a bargaining table and a settlement. And I think that a reasonable settlement will be reached if the NCAA is pushed to the point in which they do need to settle to move forward. Uh, I think it's possible that what Alyssa suggested and had insinuated might have been the result in O'Bannon, while I don't think that's a direct result, maybe that would be optimal. Maybe one option would be to have money kept in trust for the athletes. Uh, I think one would be same payment for all athletes on the team. Another would be a free market, but I think all of these are substantial steps in the right direction. I, I think we wouldn't be sitting here today and again, perhaps this is naive, if the NCAA did something in 2011. In 2011, the NCAA had a proposal on the table at the Division I level to grant something called a full cost of attendance scholarship. There's research that shows that what an athlete scholarship covers and what it actually costs to be a student, so take a girl on a date, buy yourself a movie ticket, buy yourself a new suit when you have to travel to those games, what it actually costs to be a student, there's a $2,500 gap. Um, I, I talk to my student athletes, and my student athletes at the university are very well taken care of, but I say, okay, what, what, what doesn't your scholarship cover? Well, Professor Jessup, sometimes when I'm late to class, I park in the red zone. I'm not supposed to park there. I get a parking ticket. I have to find the money for that. My scholarship doesn't cover that. And when these kids don't have time to work, they don't have time to work during the summer because they're training for football. They definitely don't have time to work during the school year because their football commitments are more than 20 hours and then they have to do my homework. Where are they getting that parking ticket money? And it, it, it's much bigger than parking tickets, but that's the simplest example. And I think if the NCAA had just approved that um, piece of legislation that it tabled, there wouldn't be 100 plus of you in this room today because I think the issue would have slowed down. So I think that's the first thing that needs to happen out of this entire process. And I think it's a simple issue that most people would agree with. Oh, I agree with you wholeheartedly here too. Um, and I think it's sad that it's come to this. You know, college athletes have been looking for small changes for a long period of time. And it seems they continue to get pushed away. Uh, I spoke at a symposium at the University of Pennsylvania Law School a few weeks ago. You had an athletic director from a major conference that said he didn't support this. It was the NCAA commissioner. We had someone from the NCAA commissioner's office who said the commissioner's office doesn't support this. It's the members. Nobody wants to take responsibility. And you know the final straw, if you accept, if you accept the Northwestern unionization efforts and you accept Kane Coulter's word, 
The final straw didn't even have anything to do with money at all. The final straw that led to the college athletes unionizing is there were players who brought lawsuits about concussions that they suffered playing football and playing other sports. And as a basic tort duty, you would think that the NCAA would acknowledge and owes a duty of care to protect its student athletes from head injuries. First, because the student athletes don't have their own representation. Second, because the NCAA was created in 1905 just for that reason. And in the NCAA's brief, it said that it has no special duty of care to protect its athletes. So the reality is, it's not just that they don't want to share the revenue. They're claiming that they have no duty, special or elevated, to protect the athletes. Yet at the same time, they don't want the athletes to be able to have their own unit to bargain for it on its own. Lawyers, that's the problem. <laughs> you know, not a penny, <laughs> not a penny out there, not a penny to pay the student athletes. But how big is that fund that they have to litigate this all the way to the Supreme Court if they can? All right, if we keep it brief, we have time for two more questions. So. What, uh, what does it cost a Division I school to support an athlete for a year? It depends. Um, I, I hate that answer. That's a, that's a favorite answer by a lawyer. It depends, but it really depends. Some schools discount the tuition for their student athletes, and then they pass on that discounted rate to the general student body. So again, it's just a matter of accounting and Mark might be able to speak to that in more detail. I don't know. No, I think you're right. It, it depends tremendously. It depends what the sport is, how much travel they put in, uh, what the cost of the education in the classroom is, what the fixed and variable costs are. And we don't talk about fixed and variable costs a whole lot, but the reality is if you're already offering a class, if you're putting one additional person or two additional people into a class that's already being offered, the variable cost of that is actually going to be quite low. Uh, so I think there are all different accounting ways to attempt to measure it. Uh, I think it would be disingenuous if I tried to throw back a number because it really varies so much. I think Mark and I probably both know what our salaries are as professors, and I think we probably both make good salaries, but we both look at what our students are paying and recognize that the university is covering its cost with the people in our classroom and what those people are paying. I'm actually extraordinarily proud of Baruch College. Uh, we have one of the lowest tuitions in the country. Um, close to half of our students, if not more, uh, are able to attend on full aid. Uh, we make it work, and we don't even have the revenue generation of Division I sports. We keep it on Division Three, and my student athletes come to class. So do mine. No. I, and you know, that, that's one thing I want to say is I think there's this misperception that, oh, student athletes don't care about their education. And I only started working at the University of Miami in August. And I'll be honest, I walked in with that perception. But I've been blown away by the dedication that my student athletes put in in my class. Even my football players, my basketball players, they care. They care about their education. They're active participants. They do their work. They do a great job. And so, I think it's unfair. I think members of the media throw them under the bus sometimes. In, in anything, there's going to be a few bad apples, but working for a major Division I program that has one of the most recognizable athletics programs out there, I've been tremendously surprised and well surprised about how great our student athletes are and the support that they get from the athletics department at the U. And one thing that makes me really sad, and I mean it sincerely, as someone that has chosen to go into teaching and love what I do, is in many times, it's the athletes that want to go to class. And for purposes of maximizing revenues, the conferences of the schools create schedules that forbid it. Who here, by a show of hands, is watching the NCAA tournament right now? Who here has been watching this? Thursday games, Friday games, a Monday championship, it doesn't have to be that way. You know, when I went to the University of Pennsylvania, the men's basketball team played Friday night, Saturday night, every week back-to-back -back nights and returned to campus. 
Um, at Syracuse University, I looked at their schedule this semester in their new conference. Uh, if you factor in travel days and you factor in class days, had Syracuse made it all the way to the NCAA championship, which they didn't, but had they made it there, the school would have required the student athletes to miss a quarter of the days if they want to play in all the games. You know, it's not always the student athletes that are choosing to miss class. Sometimes it's the athletic programs well, that are that, mandating it. That's what happens when you let television run college sports. It's not necessarily the athletics director, but it's the TV executive who's saying, okay, I have this lot of space that I need to fill on a Tuesday night. What sport really takes place on a Tuesday night in March? Football's <laughs> over. We even have that. I, well, we're, we're going to get to the NFL on Tuesdays at some point. We're not there yet. And so this person has to slot something in that TV schedule. What better than these kids to do that? You know, and I wish we could go back in time. I wish maybe we could go back in time and have really had college sports as an amateur program where there weren't big revenues involved, there wasn't big TV involved, um, maybe we didn't have to pay the college athletes, maybe it was true intramural but going to school to school and they were really in class. But you know, we let the media take control of this as Alicia said, we let the bottom line take control of it. Uh, the NCAA and their members were not concerned that we were going off a cliff with all of the money that was put into television broadcasts and all of the games during the week. It seems right now they're only concerned now that they have to share it. I wish this wasn't the model, but if this is the model we've gone to, if we move to a commercial model, well then we should have a free market commercial solution. All right, one last brief question. Uh, got it. All right, so I'm not a law student. I don't really know much about a lot of this. But I do, I'm wondering if you might clarify what's sort of the relationship between the antitrust and labor relations stuff and then kind of the free market system where athletes could go based on their perceived value and like sign a contract at a school to go compete. Is, I mean, are those getting at some of the same things or are those two very different uh, philosophies? Well, uh, th th there's really two roads that they can go down. Option A is unionization. Option B is the antitrust option. They're separate options. You have to pick one or the other. You cannot be represented by a union and file an antitrust lawsuit. Um, they both get at the same things. We both differ about which process gets to the path in a more efficient or better model. Mark would tell you amateurism at the sport in the, or excuse me, antitrust. antitrust. In the sports world, I think that unions get to that step in a faster, more efficient, and productive way. So they're two separate beasts. I have no idea if that answered your question or not. And you know, it almost is a matter of time to see which way we go. Um, one interesting sidelight is even with the antitrust road. If we go down fully the antitrust road, uh, I don't think if there's a ruling for the players, things will just stop. I think much like under the labor route, if the players are able to win, eventually there'll be some type of bargained or negotiated settlement. The question is, is it one that's going to come from collective bargaining, or is it one that's going to come from a settlement to an antitrust dispute that may eventually thus lead to collective bargaining? And that's why I'm a proponent for the unionization model, is it's just, in my opinion, a straight shot to what the antitrust <coughs> movement is trying to get to. This, this Jeff Kessler guy, he was the man who was involved on the uh, Players Association side of the most recent NFL and NBA lockouts. And so we see a lot of the same strategies being used here. And I personally don't think any of those strategies were effective because you had players being locked out and then negotiating deals that were worse than what they received under the previous collective bargaining agreement, arguably. But I'm very excited by today's conversation today. And I'm very excited by most of the questions because just a few years ago, the conversation seemed to be, do things need to change? And it seems like there's been a big shift from the question of do things need to change to how do we go about changing them 
and what's the optimal solution. And I think reasonable minds could really disagree on what college athletics should look like in the future. Reasonable minds could disagree about whether everyone playing should get the same amount, whether revenue generating and non-revenue generating should get the same amount, whether the free market should be the end of the day. What I'd like to believe that if not all, at least an overwhelming majority of us could agree to though, is that the current system where there's $11 billion in college sports and athletes are being pulled out of class substantially to maximize the revenues does not justify a result that even when these students graduate, if they do, they don't get anything monetarily and they're not fully protected while they're risking themselves for a very lucrative and valuable enterprise. All right, well, th I'd like you all to join me in thanking our guests. <laughs> I know, I know I could listen to them for the rest of the night, but I know many of you probably uh, want to get home. But I, w I want to thank you all very much for coming out. And again, uh, please check the, the back of your program for the upcoming events and look, look for those uh, coming up soon. So thank you very much and have a good night.